Mummy is coming to hold the baby. Okay. This is the, my assistant who's on the side, on the lateral side. So we're doing the left foot, then the, we'll move to that end of the table. So this L shape works very well. Okay. And you have the mother comforting the child so that the child is uh, not crying and kicking. So the first step, when you look at the child, of course, we are presuming they have done the whole detailed examination of the face, the torticollis, the back, the hips, and then we have come to the foot. Before you start doing anything, the first thing to look at is the Pirani score. All right. So you must focus on the Pirani score because that's the first step that we are attending. Okay. So the first is to look at the Pirani score. So Pirani score, we said. Of course, we can't do this in the child. We can't amputate the leg, but since this is a model. So what we are looking at here is we are looking to see medial crease, look, we are looking to see curve, <coughs> so therefore we put a scale or a ruler or a pen on the lateral border of the hind foot and see how much of the foot is, uh, is lying away from the ruler. So here you can see it's a 1 and then we are moving, so we are identifying lateral malleolus, tailor head and then trying to see the coverage of the tailor head by the navicular, so that also is a 1. So 1, 1 and 1, so that's a 3 by 3 on the midfoot score. Hind foot score. We are looking to see again a deep crease, so that's one. If I look at the empty heel sign, this also feels soft like my thinner eminence, so that's also a one. And if I see rigidity of equinus, it's not going into, plant, into dorsiflexion, so therefore this is also one. So basically three by three, three by three. So six by six is the Pirani score. All right. So once I've done that, so now I note it down because I think every time it's important that we note this down by the counselor or by the doctor whoever is doing that. Okay. Now we come to the manipulation phase. Manipulation phase, since this is the first cast that this child is getting, we are obviously doing the cavus correction first. How to do the cavus correction, we've already said. Never just identify the tailor head as the most prominent point. That's a big mistake that everyone makes. Always go in a same standardized step-by-step -step manner. Feel the lateral malleolus, go in front and slightly below, and the first bony landmark on the dorsolateral part of the foot is the tailor head. If you go too low below, this is the calcular cuboid joint, and that's where we don't want to go to. Okay? So that's the wrong method because that will correct the forefoot abduction, adduction, no doubt, but it will not allow the heel to move because you're blocking the boat from moving in the Ganga. All right? So our thumb is always over the tailor head. So how do I stabilize the foot is important. So you have the assistant here. Ideally, Matthew should be on that side because you're dealing with the right foot, but that's okay for now. So I've seen commonly people ask the assistant to hold the foot here, the leg here. That doesn't help because this child can still kick. Okay, This model is not going to, but when we start doing it on the live child, he's going to start kicking. So what we do is tell the assistant to hold it this way. All right, As proximal as you can go, but hold the proximal part of the leg. Don't press over the fibula head because that's very sensitive. Think as if you're holding a ball and not as if you're creating a vice. All right, So this is the best method that Matthew is holding, almost like a ball, very soft and don't, if the child is struggling, move with the child. Okay? The important thing is the more you restrict the child, the more the child is going to uh, resist and try to start to cry. So over time you'll realize. The biggest mistake is to tighten your grip. The child will scream more and fight more. Yeah. Never tighten your grip on a child. Okay? So if the child is moving, move with the child, try and comfort the child a little more, get the child as quiet as possible. So now my first step is my manipulation. So I've done the Pirani score. Now the first step is the manual. So every time it should follow the same SOPs. Okay, yeah, think of it as if, like any surgery. So if you don't follow the standard operating protocols, you're going to make mistakes. And that's when we will end up doing 15 and 20 plasters. So if you want each plaster to count, follow the same steps every time. So Pirani score, now manipulation. Manipulation, find the lateral head of the fibula, find the fibula, go in front, the first bony prominence, tailor head. Put my thumb over that. Other fingers are not important, but I need to rest them somewhere. But I don't want to do this. This is the biggest mistake I can make because it's blocking the boat from moving. So I can hold it up, I can hold it from the top, I can do anything. But basically I only need one thumb. And then using my index and middle finger of this right hand, I'm putting my middle finger below the first ray, not over the toe, but over the first ray, and gently supinating the foot. That's all that is required. Opening the bud so that that flower begins to uh, open up from a bud into a flower, elongating the foot, correcting the relative pronation of the hind of the forefoot with respect to the hind foot, and not hypersupinating the foot. Okay, all that we want to do is bring the forefoot in line with the hind foot. This is my first manipulation, which is the cavus correcting manipulation. How long? 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Let go. Again, lift up. So if you give a sustained pressure, the child starts moving and crying. It's not good. You want it to be as um, Gentle as possible. Thanks, Matthew. So, 
Gentleness is the key. So lift, hold, let go. Lift, hold till the child allows and that gives you the end point. So that means that that is where the plaster is going to come at this end point. So that's helpful. Over the next few plasters, you're going to give subsequently more and more abduction without pronating. So the minute you have an assistant who's holding the fifth toe and does this, this is pronation. We don't want this to happen. So pronation is very bad because that brings the cavus back again, which we have tried to eliminate with our first plaster. So all along, all that we're doing is just abducting. And as you abduct, by itself, the heel is going to evert because that is the biomechanics of the subtalar joint. You cannot block or prevent it. So that's automatic. So it's not that you're doing any maneuver for eversion. As you abduct the foot, the hind foot is going to abduct, evert, and dorsiflex because of the magic of the kinematics of the subtalar joint. Okay? So this is my maneuver. So the first plaster is only this. So this is my manipulation. <coughs> and I stop there. Okay? And now in this position, the radius and ulna fracture is reduced. This is my reduction. And now someone has to hold that reduction because if I don't hold the reduction, I've lost the, the fracture again. Okay? So this manipulation and holding the reduction is the next step. And now I'm ready to start the plastering. So manipulation and holding. Manipulation and holding. If I let go, the fracture is displaced all over again. So now my assistant has to come into the picture and start holding. And Matthew, of course, is placed on the wrong side. I he should be here. But let's presume that, so now he's holding from there and then Matthew will have to hold from below there. So, how will you do that? It's going to be a little difficult. I think maybe one of you can come. Let's use you only inside. Because you're on the right position. So you can hold that foot here and just gently abduct the foot. No, just hold the toes from the top. So all you're doing, you know, that hand. This here. This there, all right? So only hold the toes, and as I said, use only one or two fingers, but don't use all the fingers which will make it go into pronation. So only hold a few fingers and as distal as you can get, okay? So this is the position that he's holding. So hold this here, hold that there, and turn the leg inside from here. So don't let the leg move, okay? And the foot is being held in this position. Now I'm starting with the casting. Okay, so my, uh, my deformity is reduced. So I'm going to start going over his fingers. So your finger have to come slightly like this. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So in the first one, take a few couple of turns. Not too much, just a couple of turns, and then overlap only by half. So overlap by half. Fifty percent overlap. Overlap by half. And you can see that this is not like in a fracture where I'm rolling it smoothly. I'm lifting it up to apply a little pressure, okay? Because it has to be a firm soft roll and a firm cast. And I'm going right till there. And then sometimes I complete the soft roll all the way to the top. So you can let go of this here. And I go, remember it's a toe to groin plaster. It's not an above knee plaster. It's toe to groin. So it go all the way right to the groin. And here again, at the top, you can give a couple of turns. So the only time you give two or three turns are in the most distal yeah. part and the most proximal part. Everywhere else, it's only a single turn. You've seen what we have done. We, while we were, we all were watching, we cut the soft roll and we cut the plasters also because you can't have a four-inch plaster or a three-inch plaster. The size of the foot is two inches. It's like you're doing a forearm reduction and you're applying a six-inch plaster for the forearm. We never do that. For the forearm, we use four inches. For the lower limb, we use six inches. Same way, this is a two-inch foot. So your plaster also has to be two inches long, and the soft roll also has to be two inches, not long, but wide. Okay? Uh, pani. Pani. So water ideally should be warm, because if it is cold water, it is not helpful, because that takes longer for the plaster to set. Uh, I need the towel. So ideally it should be warm water. Okay? Especially in the winter time, if you use cold water, it is terrible for the child, and terrible for you also, because the plaster does not set in that much time. Yeah? So the warmers, all these small little tips and tricks are very important to help us to get the best plaster possible. So while my uh, assistant is holding the reduction, I've opened up one layer so I don't have to struggle to find the edge. Because if I don't do that, once I put it in the water, I won't be able to find this edge of the plaster. So I open it a little bit, and I dip it into the plaster, into the water, and squeeze out slightly. Okay, and now I have to work quickly. So I'm going from over his fingers, from dorsal to plantar, lateral to medial. So that gives a bit of an abduction tug. And you can see I'm lifting up the foot, the plaster off the foot as I'm doing it. So it's a firm plaster. It is not a loose one. 
No, so stay where your fingers are. Your fingers no, cannot take move. That off. Your fingers no, have to move. Reduction. Yeah. So I'm going to the below knee part only. Then I'm coming back again, lifting it off, holding with some pressure. Okay. So this is very important that we lift off and hold the the plaster in the right uh, way. And then I know the plaster is not setting yet, so I'm going to only smoothen out the plaster right now because if I start molding the foot too early, it's not going to work. So we know that I need to smoothen out the plaster and smoothening out helps because what I do by smoothening, that's the next layer, that's in the next layer. So what I do by smoothening out the plaster like this is that all the layers of plaster bond to each other. You can't have plaster in layers, it's not a layered cake. Each one has to bond, that only you become a, a proper plaster, so therefore I'm allowing the plaster layers to bond with each other as I'm doing this. And now I know that the plaster is changing color. It is becoming from shiny to dull. When this plaster starts becoming dull, I know it's going to start setting and I have very little time to work on it. Now I move from the two hand position, so I can leave let go now, now my assistant let go. So if I use a two hand position, what can happen here is that this will cause a lot of pressure over the tailor head. Okay, that's a mistake because what can happen here, I can cause a big dent. So I move to this one hand maneuver where I put my thumb to index, index to thumb. And I'm doing the same maneuver but now this other hand is free to mold around the heel. Okay, so this hand flat is flattening the plaster. I don't want a round plaster. If I land up with a round plaster, it's wrong. I want to flatten my plaster. Okay. So while it is setting, I'm moving my fingers over this tailor head, I'm moving my fingers over the calcaneus, I'm flattening out the foot, okay, and I'm working in the region of the tailor head. So these fingers are constantly moving and flattening out. So Jose Morgante talks about it like a bill of a duck. So like a duck bill, you want to get it flat, okay? Not this. You don't want a round plaster, you want to flatten it out and you want to mold. Okay, and at the end you will see that there is no dent. You don't want to create a dent. So I've seen people who do are doing this, and this is what we should avoid. If you're doing, there's no harm, but then that thumb also has to move. If it's not moving, you're going to end up with a dent in the plaster. Okay, so this is the first layer, and once this first layer is done, your molding is done. The rest of the plaster that you're putting, I want you to strengthen the plaster now. You can't do any more molding. So this first plaster is the most crucial one, because all your molding, everything is based on this. Okay. Of course, we are not done it the right way because all this should be much more distal. Unfortunately, we should have had someone standing on this side. But then you can cut back on this because on the bottom of the foot, you should have the plaster going right till the tips of the, the toes. Tips of the toes. And on the dorsum, it should come to the base of the toes. So it should be an asymmetric way that we are cutting the plaster. Then the next plaster that I am putting are only for reinforcement. And what I like to do is to create a slab so that there is no concentration of the plaster on the dorsal aspect. So I make a small slab and I use that on the plantar aspect of the foot. So that helps me to create a foot plate which goes right to the tips of the toes and strengthens that posterior and medial part of the plaster. Okay. So this foot plate strengthens the plaster on the, on the lateral aspect and helps to go right to the tips of the toes. But now you have noticed that I am not doing any more molding. The molding is all over with the first plaster. So that first plaster, spending time on it, doing it in the right manner is very crucial. Okay. Now the remaining plasters are only going to smoothen out the plaster and reinforce it. Okay. So ideally speaking what I do is for a young child like this I take a 4 inch plaster and cut it in half. So I have in width 2 inches and 2 inches. And then in length I also make it half. So basically from one 4 inch plaster I get 4 rolls. And those 4 rolls are sufficient for a foot like this. 2 rolls for the below knee part, 2 rolls for the, for the uh, above knee groin cast. So that's more than sufficient. And when you go above knee, you can also put a slab here. So I can I make two slabs. One is on the plantar aspect to form a foot plate, and one is on the dorsal aspect of the knee to form a knee plate. So that otherwise, what happens is all the plasters are concentrating on the concave surface of the bone of the foot. Okay. So this is my manipulation. So I, you just need to practice those steps. So the manipulation is different from the molding. So the molding we switch to this one hand technique. There's no harm if you use a two hand. Okay, but if you're using the two-hand technique, don't hold it that way and leave it. I've seen many people do this, it's like as if it's static and you're dead. It won't work because this will cause a big dent on the dorsum and land up with the pressure sore. So if you're using the two-hand technique, like sometimes with a bigger child, you might want to use the two-hand technique, but then keep moving your thumb as it is setting. This one-hand technique works well because with the one-hand technique, I can 
squeeze the foot down. I can move around the region of the tailor head. I can use this other finger of mine to mold around the heel. So this molding behind the heel is very crucial. So if you look at this, at the heel here, this molding is very important. If I see a straight plaster like this, I know that is a cause for an atypical club foot. See, see the undersurface. Yeah? You can see the shape of the heel there. So this molding around the heel is very, very crucial. And if you don't have this, this is what causes an atypical club foot because then you have a straight border and then the foot slips inside that and gets squashed against the back of the plaster. So these are the molds and the holdings that you have to practice out. And you can see that the plaster looks like the shape of the foot. It should not look like some big bulky mass. It should look like the shape of the foot and the ankle. Okay? And the first plaster you saw, all that I was doing was just maintaining that, correcting the cavus deformity by supinating and then using my other finger to mold around the back of the calcarium. Okay? Good. Any questions? So I think setup, this way we set these things up are very important, you know, working on this L, all right? Having the parents know where the parents are sitting, where the child is going to be, where my assistant is going to be. So today the assistant was not in the right place. place. We should ideally have been doing this on that end of the, of the yeah, bed. We should have been on that end. So that the assistant is always on the outer border of the foot and ankle. So he's holding it in correction. Okay?